Manhattan Creek, a prehistoric village in Northeast Michigan, by Dennis Michael Morrison, was published in Heritage Magazine, February 1989. The ancient site lies along Oscoda, Michigan's Manhattan Creek. This special place is only moments away from the hectic pace of Wurzmuth Air Force Base. It is an isolated piece of ground and very small. Surrounded on all sides by civilization, Old Manhattan Creek remains undeveloped and wild. As you walk along the aged pines, their needles crunching beneath your feet, there's a feeling that you are indeed in another time. That pleasant illusion is often, often shattered by the noise of nearby cars and jets as they scream overhead. Here beneath the decaying leaves and centuries of dirt and debris lie the remains of what was once a thriving Indian village. With the area all around it so changed by modern technology, this piece of land seems to be waiting, waiting for its people to return. My wife and Kathy and I <clears throat> first discovered this prehistoric site several years ago when we were on an expedition in search of antiquities. As the fates or Manitos would have it, our shovel was guided to a spot that would inspire us both greatly. So much so, in fact, that we would spend most of our spare time over the next three years doing careful excavations at this very place. My shovel sank deep into Mother Earth, and without the slightest wince at our intrusion, she yielded up a large green stone that had been used for grinding, and below that we found what is called a catch. There, before our eyes, opened wide with awe, were stone knives, scrapers, choppers, pottery shards, and other relics left behind by a prehistoric lady. These were her possessions, items used in her daily routine of preparing meals for her family. Because of the cost factor, <clears throat> Kathy and I weren't able to have carbon dates assessed on this site. Uh, luckily, there were many fragments of pottery found in this hoard, which allowed us to date our finds to that period known as the Late Woodland, somewhere between A.D. 700 and A.D. 1000. We were naturally very intrigued by the find. There were so many questions. Why did this lady of the woods bury the implements in the first place? One answer could have been that the village had been abandoned for winter and that she had placed them securely in the ground so that others who might happen upon them would not use them or, or steal them. That seems a likely scenario since villages built along streams were generally used only during the winter or the warmer months. As winter approached, the Indians moved inland. There was another nagging question, though. <clears throat> Why did she never come back to take repossession of these beautifully worked stone items? Again, <clears throat> our imaginations were set aflame. It is possible that during the fall migrations her band met with an enemy and that there was an ensuing battle. This woman, with whom we were beginning to feel a strong bond, which, had, which spanned the centuries, could have been captured and taken to an enemy camp where she might have lived out the rest of her life as a slave. And she might also have been killed. Life was not easy for the early Michiganians. Winter itself proved a hard proposition for the Indian people as they huddled in their small domed lodges, uh, perhaps she was one. Uh, perhaps she was aged or frail and fell victim to one of the <clears throat> many prevalent diseases. Perhaps it was something as simple as that she forgot where she had buried them. These people who inhabited our village were of the Chippewa background. Historically, we know that their dwellings were dome or teepee shaped. They were covered with bark to ward off the elements, and the cache was buried near the center of one of their dwellings. They were interred more than likely next to a hearth, or that is to say, a prehistoric fire pit. During the next uh, three years of excavations, we found seven such hearths. We also found the remains of more than 300 prehistoric clay pots. Now, that was at the time of this writing. By the time we had actually concluded our work, we had found the remains of over 1,500 prehistoric pots. But finding this large volume of vessels has led us to believe that this was either a very larger, a very large village site or that it had been occupied seasonally by the same group for many years in a row. While we studied the village floor, we made many finds that bespoke of daily life. Old Vanetten Creek lies on an old high bank that is now a good two blocks away from the actual stream. At the time that the village was in use, the creek was much closer. Besides being a main source of food, it also provided the basic transportation system for these people. <clears throat> right next to the bank was an area about four foot square. In this spot were thousands of flint flakes. Here an Indian man had been making arrowheads and knives. 
As we carefully excavated this small manufacturing region, it was obvious that the man had been sitting cross-legged on the ground while he was working, as there were no flakes where his legs and buttocks had rested. Indeed, he was a talented individual because many pieces of his handiwork, including several arrowheads and stone knives, were strewn about the site. These had been cast aside as though they were somehow flawed, yet they appeared perfect in all manner. Our fascinating finds were in were made in the ancient garbage pits that we discovered. There were four. There, <clears throat> there were four. One was very extensive. These sites drove home to Kathy and I, in a very real way, the old saying that one man's trash is another man's treasure. It was not uncommon to find pieces of clay pipe bowls. In fact, by the number of them we unearthed, it would appear that smoking was widely practiced. This might also give rise to the idea that these Indians were some of Michigan's earliest farmers. Uh, they must have culted a tobacco-type plant. We know for certain that they grew corn and squash. The pipes were generally very plain in appearance, but they showed a great deal of dexterity on the part of the maker. You come to realize how exceedingly creative these people were when you begin to study the remains of their pottery vessels. Most show a high degree of decoration. The pots range in size from very tiny, holding perhaps as little as a few ounces, to huge. All of the decorative designs were created by impressing fingernails, bone, sticks, or some other common implement into the wet clay before it was fired. Besides the cooking pots, we found another entire class of prehistoric vessel, children's pots. These were made either by young Indian girls imitating their mothers, or were specifically for the use of children. Some of these pots were undoubtedly <clears throat> made as toys. <clears throat> For example, we found one tiny pot that we nicknamed the Micropot. It is no bigger around than a nickel and less than half an inch high. To date, it is the only complete pot we have found. Most earthen containers are smashed to pieces by the centuries of the freezing and thawing cycle. The children's pots are quite crude and usually lacking in decoration. It also seems they were mostly bowl-shaped. Our most unique find at Old Benetton Creek was again related to a child. This was a small human head made of pottery. The head was a profile with an eye made in the appropriate place by use of a stone drill. There is little doubt that this was the head of a very crude prehistoric doll, since it was found amidst other debris relating to ancient children. These people did not seem given to making things that were not useful in their everyday existence. The few small Items, the few items recovered that could be classified as toys were rare indeed. Where also in our finds were items of personal adornment, such as jewelry. We did, however, unearth a few pieces. Thrown away because one corner was broken was a black slate pendant with a hole drilled in the middle so that it could be worn around the neck. The marks on the stone be spoke of the many hours that it must have taken to grind it down into its final form. We found a second of these, gorgets as they are called. This one was a green stone. Rather than being uh, ground out, the gorget was uh, flaked out much in the way an arrowhead was produced. If the process of grinding out a piece of jewelry from a solid chunk of stone seems arduous to you, then consider the following account. One day I unearthed the celt. This is a type of prehistoric axe. Again, the relic was flawless, and, I, I, and it was ground out of granite. I can't begin to imagine the amount of time that piece must have taken to manufacture. Using one of these crude axes was as tiresome as making one. They were not sharp enough to actually fell a tree. The Indian would burn <clears throat> a fire around the base of the tree. After burning into the tree as far as they could, they would chop away the burnt wood. This process would be repeated over and over until the tree was downed. Life was not easy at our village, not by any means. Again, through the refuse pits, we are able to tell some of the foods that were enjoyed by the people of Old Vanetton Creek. <clears throat> Freshwater clams seem to have been eaten with delight, judging by the all the shells that we found. Some of these even show traces of have been, having been used as spoons. Turtle was another favorite, and easy to obtain. There were many squirrel and deer bones, as well as teeth from beaver. Not unlike ourselves, the Indians did not enjoy looking out across their village and seeing garbage piling up. Although they did not have to have the overzoned communities that we live in today, they had certain rules that they seemed to follow. All of the refuse sites were over the bank and out of sight, or were at least a block or so away. <clears throat> 
We spoke earlier of a lady who might have been captured and never returned to take possession of her cooking items. Well, another of these rubbish clusters suggests that just such an incident may have occurred. Living at Old Manhattan Creek may have been a woman who had been captured on the East Coast. We came upon the remains of several pots decorated very oddly. The pots themselves would have been quite unusual uh, in shape for our region and they <clears throat> had they been complete. An archaeologist in Saginaw examined these pottery shards for us. He had studied on the East Coast and so was familiar with their traditions. He felt our find was very similar to what he had seen such a long ways away. Once more my imagination kicked in. How did it get here? There are a number of different ways that that could have happened. Trade routes with Indians from other parts of the country are known to have existed. Perhaps these pots came the distance filled with some commodity that, commodity that had been traded. It seems unlikely that something as fragile as earthenware would have withstood that rugged trip. Then again, perhaps a man from this camp visited the east and took a bride, bringing her back here to live. Once at Old Manhattan Creek, rather than leaving her old ways behind, she might have continued making pottery as she had been taught back home. Of course, it is unfortunate that archaeology generally does not allow us a glimpse of what these people looked like, how they dressed and kept themselves. There are, however, written re records of the Chippewa people made by the first Europeans to visit this area. From these early accounts, we can assume that the people who occupied our village site were very dark in complexion with hair black as coal. Some records also tell that it was not uncommon for Chippewa men to tower six feet or more. Early visitors found that nudity made no impression at all on these people. The men during the summertime were usually in that state. The women were given to wearing simple dresses of hide. There was one item of personal adornment that we unearthed that made us feel that in some ways things have not changed too much. We found a button made of flint, again in the same manner as an arrowhead would be made. The men of this village, like most other men of the Great Lakes region, love to have themselves tattooed. The tattooing process that these men endured was something like this. Two or three fish or animal bones that had been honed down to a point were soaked in black paint made of soft charcoal or vermilion, or even red dirt. These needles would then be forced into the skin and the, <clears throat> and the paint that they carried remained in the skin. It was to be a very painful process, but despite that, some had their entire bodies covered with tattoos. The Chippewa were considered to be the brave, bravest of the Great Lakes Indians, yet as brave as they were, they were also very superstitious. In everything alive or inanimate, they believed existed a spirit called the Manitou. These spirits guided their lives in many ways from early youth. There are many mysteries still held by this old, vi old village site. Uh, if only the winds that whisper through the pines could speak and tell of those former days now so long gone by. Uh, but contented we must be with the speculation that we can make based upon the small bits and pieces left behind and with the few written accounts of the early voyagers to the lakes region. And that concludes the article. I would encourage you to look through the list of videos that... Um, that that I have on on YouTube because there are many others that deal with Old Manhattan Creek and with the Indian uh, history and prehistory in Michigan. Thank you for listening and watching.